Hey guys, welcome to Rotor Riot. I'm Bruce FPV, and today I'm going to show you how I pit tune the Rotor Riot drums. Here at Rotor Riot, we actually sell pre built uh, drums that we tune here in house. Some people actually want to get into the tune process themselves. So, what I'm going to do today is walk you through my process on how I set up the Rotor Riot drones. So if you've watched any of our build videos, we typically show you how to configure everything in Betaflight, but we usually skip past fine tuning things like PIDs and filters because it's pretty complicated. But in this video, that's exactly what I'm gonna dig into. We're going to assume that you've already got your drone completely set up, all of your UARTs are set correctly, your motor directions are correct, and your switches are assigned. Today, I'm actually gonna dive into the ESC settings, some filter settings, and PID tuning using black box. Since we just moved to the new Betaflight 4.3, I'm having to start fresh on all of our builds so that they're on the latest and greatest stuff. So first things we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna go into the ESC settings and configure those because there's a few tweaks we can make to uh, kind of dial in our ESC settings. And to do that, you're gonna need the Beoheli 32 configurator. One thing I've noticed is uh, you can kind of run into some issues if you have both Betaflight and Beoheli 32 open at the same time. Uh, if you've got your USB plugged in, you've got your battery plugged in, ready to go, I'm gonna go ahead and close out Betaflight and only have Beoheli 32 open. I'm gonna plug in my battery because we need power to the ESC in order for this to connect. And I'm just gonna read the setup here. All right, you see it says that we have found multiple ESC configuration, changing these ESC settings. I'm only gonna be changing three, and what I'm using today are Chris Rosser's recommended settings. Uh, there'll be a link in the description below if you wanna get more in depth with how he changes these settings and the reasons behind. So the first thing I'm gonna be changing is the ramp up power. You ideally want the ramp up power to be as high as it can be so that you can access the full mechanical power of your motor. Stock settings on ramp up power should be fine, but uh, in Chris Rosser's video, he found that uh, pretty much anything over 30% um, added no benefit to the flight performance. And the higher you go with your ramp up power, um, the higher chances you run of desyncs and you know issues with motor heat, things like that. So on all of the builds that I have here at Rotor Riot, I just set it to 30% and move on. The next thing we're gonna change is gonna be the motor timing. Faster spinning motors like these five inch 2306, 2450 kV motors, they benefit from a higher motor timing. 23 degrees, it's the standard for most five inch builds. Uh, usually slower spinning motors on the other hand, seven inch props, 10 inch props, those typically benefit from a lower motor timing, so somewhere around 16, uh, 16 degrees, somewhere there. But for this five inch build, we're just gonna set it at 23 degrees and move on to the PWM frequency. It's set at 24 kilohertz on both the low and high frequency. The lower that number is, the more braking power and torque you're gonna have with your motors, but you let in more electrical noise by lowering your PWM frequency. The higher the number is, it will smooth that out, but you lose prop wash performance. The low frequency, the builds that we have here, I found that uh, leaving that at 24 kilohertz uh, is kind of the sweet spot. It doesn't allow for too much noise to come through the motors, but you still have plenty of torque for prop wash performance. PWM frequency high, um, since we have the RPM filter enabled on Betaflight, we're gonna take this slider and move it all the way up to by RPM. And what that does is basically measures the RPM of your motor and sets the frequency based on that. So now that you've got everything set up, all you're gonna need to do is hit right setup here at the bottom, and now we are done with Beoheli 32. We can disconnect. You'll hear the motors beep, letting you know that everything is disconnected. Just like that. We can remove the battery. So now that we've set up everything in BL Heli, we're gonna jump over to Betaflight. So we are plugged into the USB. First thing we're gonna jump into is the presets tab. Now with Betaflight 4.3, the presets have just made it so easy. So we're gonna be using a filter preset for the BMI 270 gyro that this quad uses. The MPU 6000 gyro that we all you know know and love, they just can't get anymore. So Everyone has moved over to this BMI 270, so pretty much for the foreseeable future, all flight controllers are gonna be using this as far as I know, or at least the ones that we carry at Rotor Riot will have this gyro on it. This gyro compared to the MPU 6000 is a little bit different because the low pass filter that is built into the gyro, I believe is at a higher frequency. Um, so there's some settings uh, that this preset has that just kind of makes everything simple for you. So all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna type in BMI 270. If you look here, we've got Dust King's BMI 270 filter settings. 
There's also an option over here for dual BMI 270. This flight controller that we're using, the T-Motor F7 HD, only has a single gyro. We're gonna select that, and you see here that we have some options. We've got a BMI 270 gyro with clean build, and I'm not using the RPM filters. Uh, we've got the build with RPM filters at D-Shot 300 and then at D-Shot 600. We've set up this quad with D-Shot 300, so we're gonna be using the second option here. Same thing, you just pick that, throws up a warning. Preset changes PID loop rate to 3.2K. I think by default this flight controller will not go any higher than 3.2K, so we don't have anything to worry about, but uh, yeah, this is just warning you, hey, don't, don't try to take it any higher than what we have it set at. Come down, hit save and reboot, and now we have the correct PID filters. If you wanted to get more in depth with actually tuning the filters, I highly recommend checking out UAV Tech's videos and uh, Chris Rosser's videos. But uh, with Betaflight 4.3 and the presets that I've got here, I really hardly have to mess with the filters tab. And I end up spending a lot more time dialing in my PID gains, the, you know, the relationship between P and D and P and I, and getting uh, the gains as high as I possibly can um, without having any you know, issues. There's this YouTube channel called PID Toolbox and he's designed a software that makes the PID tuning process very simple. And you can pretty much do it anywhere. I'm actually gonna be tuning this quad today with some very simple line of sight test hovers indoors right here in the, in the studio upstairs. There's links in the description. Uh, to PID Toolbox's YouTube channel and uh, how to set up this software. Before we do anything in that software, we need to make some adjustments to the PID settings. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to the PID profile settings and you're gonna wanna enable expert mode up here at the top. And once you've enabled expert mode, you'll see here that it's unlocked all of these new sliders. Right off the rip, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove our feed forward gains because you don't want them messing with the relationship between uh, your D and P gain. I'm also gonna remove uh, all of the dynamic dampening, bring that down to zero. So I'm only worrying about the you know st stock static uh, D gain. And then I'm also gonna remove all of the I gains. Typically on a standard five inch build, the relationship between D and P at one is probably gonna be fine, but I'm actually going to bring it all the way down to six uh, when we start, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna be doing just quick little flights with our drone. We're just going to go up for 10, 15 seconds, move it around so that you can gather some information uh, in the black box log and we can bring it over to this PID toolbox software. So now that I've made those adjustments to the sliders, I'm gonna come down and I'm, I'm gonna hit save. Dynamic idle. My understanding is what it does, helps your craft at you know low RPM, like smooth forward flight, things like that, helps uh, bobbles, and it will dynamically change your idle based on the RPM of your motors, things like that, to give you the best possible performance. The way that you're gonna wanna set that up is kind of based on the uh, pitch of your props and the size, and there's kind of an equation that you use. So for this craft, we're gonna be using a very low pitch prop. It's the J37, which is a 4.9 inch. Not exactly what, sure what the pitch is, but it's very low. It's like a three point something, very low pitch prop. And the equation that you would use to figure out your dynamic idle is you would take the number 100 and divide that by the size of your prop. So this is a five inch prop. 100 divided by five gives us the number 20. So that's what uh, you would set the dynamic idle to. If you're using a more aggressive pitch prop, you would maybe do 150 divided by the size of your prop. Typically that range is gonna be anywhere from 20 to 40 on your dynamic idle. The lower your dynamic idle is, the more inverted hang time you'll get, uh, but you run the risk of more low throttle instability. With the higher you run the dynamic idle, you'll have less inverted hang time, but a more uh, stable and locked in quad at low throttle. I kind of like dynamic idle set a little bit higher than 20, so I usually run 25. With this tuning process, I've noticed that it is probably best to do everything outdoors just because um, you add the external forces. You've got wind blowing, you've got you know the humidity in the air, things like that. It really depends on your personal environment though, because Let's say you live in a busy city, it might just be more convenient to, hey, in your living room or basement, wherever, do this tuning method. And actually, the name of this tuning method is called the basement tuning method. So pretty much anywhere you are, you could get your quad tuned. And what I'm doing here today, too, is not the, the method that's going to dial it into the absolute, you know, 
the tightest possible tune ever. This is just gonna get you in a really good spot to get a nice smooth flying quad that isn't gonna have crazy prop wash or jitters, things like that. Or at least I'm not uh, gonna want to tune our customers' quads to the absolute T because there are a lot of variables. I don't know where in the world this is getting sent. It could be somewhere um, really high altitude. That affects tune, things like that. So I like to tune my quads so that if I were to crash, mess up some props, uh, I could easily fly it back to me without burning up a motor or frying an ESC, things like that. But you'll still get a lot better performance than the stock settings that Betaflight gives you. After I've saved those settings, we're gonna wanna change our rate settings. Since I'm only doing line of sight test, you do not want to have crazy 1000 degree rates. So what I do using the actual rates here is I go all the way down to 250 degrees per second. Roll, pitch, and yaw. And another thing that I do is I make them linear. And to do that, you just take the center sensitivity and you crank it up until you see this line here um, on the rates preview straighten out. And I believe that is also 250. And then I don't add any additional expo. So very straight linear rates maxed out at 250 degrees. And the reason I'm doing that is uh, since we are flying this line of sight, I, I'm gonna be doing a lot of crazy stick movements back and forth, and if I'm at 1,000 degrees per second, I, yeah, there's no way I'm gonna be able to control this thing. So slow it down a little bit, that way I can yank the sticks around no problem, and I know that I can still control the quad. Last thing we're gonna to need to set up are the black box settings. Only thing you're gonna to need to adjust or just make sure is the flight controller we have here does have an onboard flash, so we're gonna be using the internal SD card that is on this flight controller. If you had uh, an external SD card, you could select that up here in the drop down. The only other thing I change is the logging rate. The higher this number is, the more data you're able to collect in your black box log. If you go too high, it could tax the processor on your flight controller and cause some issues. So the recommended setting to use for your logging rate should be at one half, and that's 1600 hertz with this flight controller. You have those settings selected. You can hit save and reboot. Another thing too, I'm gonna go back down to the black box here and just confirm that my settings are saved. I've done a couple test flights on this quad, so I have some black box information saved here. I wanna wipe out all of that stuff, so what I'm gonna do is uh, erase the flash on this uh, flight controller. After it erases, everything will be set up. Another nice feature, at least in this version of Beta Flight, everything's automatic. So as long as you have your black box configured, as soon as you arm the drone, it's going to record the black box information. All right, so we've finished up erasing all of the uh, information on there. So we've, we're, we're blank, we've got plenty of free space, and we can do our first test flight. We're going to be doing multiple quick little line of sight flights. We're going to be taking the craft up, and we're just going to be doing, you know, very strong stick inputs. It's gonna be looking like this as we do our test hover. We're gonna record that 15 second flight, and after each one of those, we're gonna go back into beta flight, and we're gonna move certain sliders one at a time, in you know, increments of two or three, and we're gonna take each one of those logs, and we're gonna compare all of them in the PID toolbox. One thing that I do recommend when doing this, only arm the drone once per plug-in of the battery because every time you plug in the battery, it resets the flight controller, which allows you to start a completely new log every time you arm the drone. Get it up in the air, and what we're gonna do, we have these slow rates, we're just going to pitch and roll in all directions for about 10, 15 seconds. And you want them to be pretty strong movements. But yeah, just like that. You can now land the drone. Now we're gonna go back to beta flight. And this process is actually going to be so much easier if you're on analog or using the Fat Shark Dominator system because you have canvas mode and you can actually use your goggles to go in and uh, move the sliders quickly and you don't have to unplug the battery. Yeah, it just makes life easier. But we're first starting off by trying to find the best relationship or the best uh, P to D gain ratios. All we're doing is we're starting with our D gains pretty low compared to P, and we're just, each one of these flights that we're due, we're gonna raise this slider, this uh, dampening slider, we're gonna raise it in increments of two. So we just did our first flight with the dampening slider at 0.6, now we're gonna slide it up to 0.8, hit save, and do another quick 15 second flight. You're keeping P locked, and you're just slowly, in each one of these logs, you're changing the D gain. By doing this, you'll be able to see um, what a low P to D ratio looks like versus a higher P to D ratio, and you'll see each step along the way. By 
looking at all of those at once, you can pick the best one that best suits your quad. I'm not locking in any settings yet until uh, I look at these logs that I'm creating. And boom. We go from 0.8, we're gonna slide it up at another increment of two. Now we're at one. All right. Now that we are moving into the higher values on this D-gain slider, I'm starting to notice uh, kind of this trilling sound in the motors. I don't know if you're able to hear it on the audio here. It's kind of this trilling high-pitched sound that you get from the motors as D-gain starts to go too high. With our test here, I'm actually going to push it too high just so you can hear what that trilling sounds like. We are up to slider 1.4 now. I'm pretty sure, based off a of previous test, is way too much dampening for this quad. Yeah, I'm getting I'm kind of, I'm starting to hear it, basically, is uh, what I'm noticing. And usually when you hear things that aren't smooth, it's time to back them down a little bit. So, just getting our test. Little 15 second flight, and... Ooh, back down. Right there when I landed too, um, I got a little bump and it sounded like uh, motors ramped up real quick, which is another sign that D-gain is too high because it's, it acted like it wanted to do this flyaway thing. Just me, without disarming, bumping it off the ground, it spun the motors up real high and it kind of acted like it wanted to take off. So I think we've, we've reached a point with D-gain where it's probably over dampened, so it's not worth going back in and uh, doing another flight and sliding that slider up. So now I'm gonna plug into Betaflight and pull those black box logs. To do that, you're gonna go down to the uh, black box uh, tab at the bottom, and you're going to activate mass storage device mode. Kind of basically turns your flight controller into a USB uh, drive. And you can see here that you've got your five logs that we just took. So you've downloaded the most recent version of PID Toolbox, and uh, you've opened up the folder on your computer somewhere. You're just going to want to open up the PID Toolbox folder here, open up the main folder inside there, and then you can see that you have your PID Toolbox application. Now to access the black box logs that you just recorded, you're gonna need to get those logs into this main folder here that also has the application. So I'm gonna select all five of those logs that I just took, slide those over here. All of the files are in the the main folder of your PID Toolbox software. Now you can open up the PID Toolbox log viewer. First thing you're gonna to need to do is select those log files that you've just moved to that main folder. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Open those up. Ah, this is a good example of what I was talking about earlier, making sure to unplug your battery every time you arm the quad and record a log. Because right here on this log, you can see that there are two separate recordings. Um, this happened because I armed the quad disarmed and then rearmed the quad. Uh, so you can see here the duration of the first one is only 0.8 of a second, and the second option here was the full 28 second flight that I did. So uh, when you see this error, or when you see this message pop up, you're just going to select the longer of the two flights. So now, cool, those have loaded in and you got these squiggly lines um, showing up on the screen here. And what this is showing you is the gyro information and the set point information. And these lines up and down are the stick inputs that uh, you've made. So one cool thing um, with this PID Toolbox basement tuning method is, I believe his name Brian White, the, uh, the person that came up with this software, found that you don't necessarily have to make crazy big stick inputs. Like you don't have to do full 360 degree flips and rolls to get good information out of your black box logs. So just these simple little you know, twitches back and forth is able to pull all of this great information. First thing we need to do is trim up each one of these logs. And to do that, you're gonna select the trim tool. Basically the reason we're doing this is you only want the actual flight data in this log. So the takeoff and the landing, you don't want any of that information here, so we're just gonna trim that off. You'll go through and select each one of these files one at a time. Uh, looks here, some of my flights are a little longer than the others, but doesn't really matter because all the information's the same. Okay. Now, once you've trimmed up all of the black box logs, 
you're gonna wanna go into the step response tool. You're gonna wanna select all five of the uh, logs that you've uh, ported over and you're gonna run those. Whoa, we've got some crazy squiggly lines popping up here on the screen. Another thing um, that is recommended you do because the information kind of gets uh, confusing here is just add the Y correction and that will kind of straighten up everything on this line. What I need to do is reset this and only have one log showing. Basically what you have here in this step response tool, you have this graph and it shows you the relationship between your set point and your gyro. What you want is your set point, which is the command that you're giving the drone to match and line up with your gyro perfectly. The gyro is what um, is trying to follow your set point. It's trying to follow the uh, stick command that you're assigning. You want those two to line up in line as possible. If you look here, the one on this graph is your set point, and the line, the swiggly line here, is your gyro. So you've got that information for roll, pitch, and yaw. We are only doing this for pitch and roll. We're not really worrying about yaw because don't really use much yaw in, in our flying. So I let the sliders do the yaw tuning for me. I let it kind of come along for the ride. So I'm really only focusing on pitch and roll with this process. We've got the line in the middle, this one. And what we're looking to do is we're trying to get it so that the gyro line go straight up to the one here as quickly as possible um, without overshooting like you see here. We've got these five separate logs here. And if I wanted to, I can run all five of them at the same time. Uh, currently right now, I have our first log, which had our P gain set at 45 and our D gains down very low. The slider was down at 0.6. And looking at the graph here, you can see that there isn't enough D gain because the line is going past one, which is our set point going past. It's overshooting past set point, and it's uh, kind of bouncing back here. Um, it does eventually reach set point, but it's not clean. It's going past and then eventually making it to it. So what do we do to fix that? Typically, you add more D gain to dampen out that overshoot. So on our second log, I'm going to add to this. You can see now that the line has come down a little bit and I've moved up from uh, 17 on the D gain to 23 on the D gain. It's getting a little bit better, but it could use a little bit more. So I'm gonna run log three, where I've bumped the D gain up to 30, and it's starting to look pretty good here. We're getting really close to set point. And actually, I can go back, reset, and just show you log three. That's getting pretty close. Probably could use a little bit more D gain. Um, you know, really uh, even it out right here. But we're looking pretty good. Number three, which is one on the slider, we're 45 and 30. Um, 45 for P, 30 on the D gain. It's, it's probably looking as best as it's gonna be, but let's go ahead and look at the other logs. You can start to see over dampening. So here on log four, you can see, at least on pitch, it's it's having a harder time getting up to set points over dampened. And then same thing on number five. Yeah, let's see, let's look at number five. Yes, it's definitely over dampened. It's not actually making it to set point. Um, it's definitely not overshooting. And you can see here with that extra D gain all the way up at 42, it's, uh, it's over damped, it's kind of pushing. So basically what you wanna see is you want this line right here to make it to set point uh, without overshoot and without this line right here. Three is probably the sweet spot. I can tweak the sliders around a little bit to get rid of this little bit of overshoot. So yeah, if I wanna get really particular and really you know anal about this, I will go back into beta flight here. You can play around with the pitch dampening and tracking. Like maybe you need just a hair more D gain on pitch to you know make it so that these uh, step response sliders are dialed in, you know, a little bit more, things like that. You can kind of go down a rabbit hole by doing that. You'll be taking out another log, going over here, tweaking one setting, back again. This right here looks pretty good. An interesting thing to point out is that after all of those tests, it turns out that the default setting of one on the D-gain slider is actually best for this build. But still good that we went through this process to figure it out. Now that we've figured out the best relationship between our P-gains and D-gains, we can start messing with the master slider. What I like to do is first start off a little bit lower with the master slider. You're just going to crank this up in increments of two. In the step response tool that we were using just earlier, 
if you start to notice a lot of ice oscillations in those lines there, like very big swooping oscillations, usually that means your gains are too high. So that's why I like to just start off a little bit lower than normal, and I'm just, I wanna see all the data that I can. So I'm gonna start at 0.8, I'm gonna crank it up to 0.2, 1.2, 1.4, and uh, the noises I was talking about before, when I'm listening to the flights, it really comes out when you're moving the master slider. So yeah, we'll start it off in 0.8, and we're gonna go back again, and we're gonna record three or four more flights. And I guess it's worth mentioning that doing this test flight right here um, isn't the easiest thing in the world. It really does make more sense to do this outside, but you, you can do it inside if you absolutely have to. I'm definitely hearing the, the trilling oscillation sound. It's a kind of sound. That's, yeah, gains are way too high. Now this would probably be flyable, but uh, I'm pretty sure right now, just from that, if I feel these motors, yeah, they're, they're actually fine, but I can feel some heat. So we've maxed out on 1.8 on the slider. So we're gonna do the same thing we did for the P to D balance. We're gonna do the same thing here where we take those logs and we put them in the PID toolbox folder. I did not format that, so we're just gonna wanna move the new logs that we just uh, recorded into that main folder. So we've got everything from five down. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. We're gonna bring those over here. After they've moved over, you can go back into the uh, PID toolbox tool. Since we're new using uh, our new logs, you can just reset this here and select the new logs that we're gonna be using. Using everything down from six to 11. So just gonna select those and open. Same thing again, where I uh, armed twice on one of my logs, so I'm selecting the one for two sec or 22 seconds. Hit OK, and we're gonna trim them up again. So, back to that step response tool. We're gonna select these five here, and we're gonna run this with the Y correction on. Okay, things are looking a little odd here. Each one of the colors represents a different log. Each one of these logs, we had different uh, master multiplier settings. So if you look here at the darkest value, uh, 35 was what we had set for the P gain, 23 is what we had set for the D gain, and we're just moving that slider up uh, on each one of these logs so you can see the values increasing. Everything looks kind of similar here, it's all you know smashed together. So if I just want to open up one of those logs one at a time, this is when I had the master multiplier all the way down at 0.8. Uh, these are not aggressive enough games, so I'm getting this overshoot right here. I can open up the next one, which is the master multiplier at one. Same thing, they're still not aggressive enough. I'm getting some like overshoot over here at 1.2. This one's looking a lot better. So I'm thinking that we're, our gains are starting to get uh, in the right spot. We're getting right up to uh, our set point, and we've got a pretty smooth line across the board here. But as we keep raising that slider up, you'll start to see these oscillations. So you can see here, P gain, the, just the gains are getting too high. So you're getting these little wobbles and oscillations, and that's that trilling sound I was telling you about earlier. Run the next flight log, and yeah, you're just getting these oscillations letting you know that gains are, are way too high. So based out of all three of these, the one that looked best to me is gonna be uh, log eight, which we had our P set to 53 and our D gain set to 35 on roll, 56 and 40 on pitch. So yeah, every, it's coming straight up to set point just the way I want, or as cleanly as possible with this quick tune. This position on the master slider is gonna be the best for our tune. I believe that was at master slider 1.2. We're getting close to being finished. We've got two more sets of flights to do. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna bring in our eye gain. And same thing, we're gonna do some quick little tests and we're trying to find the best I to P balance. For this slider, we're gonna be moving it up in increments of three. If you only go up in smaller increments, it's kind of hard to see the differences on that step response tool. So uh, 0.3 is usually where I go, starting on the slider and I'm gonna move it up in increments of three. So 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, uh, 1.2, probably the highest I'm gonna go is 1.2 because usually when um, you start getting higher on the eye gains, it's gonna force uh, some overshoot. So usually on most of our five inch builds, I end up around 0.6, somewhere there, but we're gonna do that same test again so you can uh, visually see what's happening. Before we actually go into our flights, let's look at our black box log. And actually, yes, you can see here that we've used up quite a bit of space. So it's 
it's uh, good in this process to, to go back and actually uh, erase that information so that uh, you have a clean slate to work off. All of these quick flights, they're gonna fill up your uh, internal storage on the flight controller pretty quick. And nothing is more frustrating than thinking that you're taking a black box log when nothing's actually recording because you're maxed out on space. Now we're formatted and we're ready to do our P to I balance test. All right, so we can see here, everything kind of looks the same. I'm noticing some stuff here that the more eye gain I add, the higher it's supposed to overshoot. The last bit of eye gain that I added, it didn't overshoot that much. I can't say that sometimes things just don't show up exactly how you expect them to show up. Um, if you're having issues getting good information, you might have to go back and re-record some stuff or re-record your logs. Yeah, so for whatever reason, this is not giving me the data that I expected. As I raise eye gain, I typically, what I expect to see is for this line to overshoot past the set point line at one there. And I'm kind of getting some odd information. So yeah, what I'd like to do here is just record maybe a few more extra logs. This battery I've been using the whole time is like pretty dead at this point. So that very well could have affected the results that I just got. So I'm gonna grab a fresh battery. Now that I've noticed that, that brings up a good point that uh, while you're doing this, uh, each one of your sets of tests, you want the battery voltage to probably be close to the same for each one of your tests. If uh, I had some charge, I don't know, 3.8, 3.9 volts per cell when I started, and then if uh, by the time I get to my last test, my cell voltage is down to 3.4, it's not gonna give me great information. <laughs> Took the slider all the way down from 0.3 up to 1.3, so I'm hoping we should have some pretty good information here. This information is a little bit better, it looks like. You can see here, as, I, as the eye gains get higher, you start to see more and more overshoot. It looks like here, probably between orm, let's see, probably between red and the darker maroon are gonna be our two options. Those look like they come straight up to set point. So let's reset. We're gonna compare between these two. Number one, that's where their eye gain's all the way down at 28. Number two, looks a little bit cleaner. So I'm gonna run number two. That to me, between the two, looks like the cleanest option. So I believe that's when we had our uh, eye gain slider down at 0.6. Like I said, you can really fine tune and tweak these, take hundreds of logs and just you know look at your step response tool over and over and over again. But you just wanna kinda get it as close as possible without driving yourself insane. So to me, this is a pretty good baseline. Uh, I can review one step up just to see compared to this, but yeah, I'm definitely getting too much overshoot here. So based on these results, P at 53 for roll, I at 57, and our D at 35 should be pretty good. Let's just look at it one more time for a sanity check. Across the board, that looks pretty good. We're gonna go back to this uh, PIDs here, and we're gonna move that drift wobble eye gain slider down to 0.6. The Final slider step that we have to worry about is going to be the feed forward gains. Best way to look at this, uh, the feed forward slider is still gonna be in the PID toolbox, but you're not gonna be using the step response tool anymore. You're just gonna be looking at the uh, gyro versus set point data here on the main screen. And what you're gonna wanna do, kinda zoom in using the zoom feature. If you look, you can see that there is a uh, red line here, which is your set point, that's what you're commanding the quad to do, and then you've got gyro, which is what the quad is actually doing. And if you see that there is this little gap here between the two, and that's phase delay. And what feed forward is gonna do by increasing that is uh, decrease the phase delay, and it's gonna bring these two lines a lot closer together. So the best way to, to test this and figure it out, at least from the simple PID toolbox tuning method is to just slowly take some logs, same as we've been doing, and increase the stick response slider uh, after each flight. On average, uh, between 0.5 and 1 seem to be a really good sweet spot, so I uh, usually start off around 0.5 and just take logs where I step it up in increments of uh, 1. Cool. Now this time around, uh, you don't have to worry about trimming anything up because we're not gonna be using the step response tool. 
we're just going to be looking at the traces here. Let's zoom in. I'm going to roll here. This is with a, a feed forward set at 0.5. You can still, you can see that there's some latency between uh, set point and gyro. Move on to the next log. I just visually look at the lines here and I just look for them to get closer and closer together. So as I look at each one of these logs and I zoom in, you'll start to see that the traces will almost line up on each other. So we're at 0.8, this is 0.9. Yeah, they're definitely getting closer, especially here in the start. They're almost like right on top of each other. Number nine, number 10, this is probably close to where we're gonna wanna be. Yeah, they're like basically on top of each other here. But if we look at the very last log where I cranked the feed forward slider all the way up to like 1.6 or 1.5, You'll probably start to see some overshoot here. Yes, you can see now that gyro, especially up here on some of these traces, is uh, shooting past set point. It's overshooting. You don't want to overshoot. So that's a little overkill on feed forward, but it's a feel thing, so you can kind of play around. But the uh, main thing I'm trying to explain and show you here is that as you bring uh, your feed forward gains higher, it will reduce the latency uh, between set point and gyro. So for me, uh, I think the sweet spot is probably gonna be, yeah, I think number nine is gonna be the sweet spot. And that is when I had the slider set to 0 0.9. 0 0.9, so bring that back down. We'll hit save. And now it's time to go out and do a test flight, an actual, an actual test flight. Main reason we're going out to do this test flight is to verify that everything is working smoothly, but also we're gonna be, uh, messing with our anti-gravity gain. I've already bumped this up to a number that uh, I'm pretty sure works best on all of our quads, but I'm gonna set it to 3.5 for right now, which is the stock setting. Anti-gravity, it has to do with eye gain, but uh, the best way to explain it is when you're flying and you're doing fast throttle movements, when anti-gravity is not set correctly, you'll notice that the nose of the drone as you're adjusting throttle, no pitch, no roll input, anything like that, but as you're adjusting throttle, you'll notice the nose bobble up and down like that. As you bring up anti-gravity gain, it'll fix that issue to where you pump throttle and everything is locked. It's noses and bobbling. UAV tech calls them throbbles. <laughs> yes. But it's just like with anything, um, there's like a sweet spot. As you're cranking up the anti-gravity gain, you'll notice uh, once you've gone too far that the throttles kind of come back and actually, as you do these fast throttle movements, you'll get weird jitters and uh, just, just weird things will start happening. So there is a sweet spot for the anti-gravity. The test flights we're gonna be doing are three main things. We're, we're gonna be doing smooth forward flight. We just wanna see that the craft moves forward in a you know smooth, straight line. It's prop wash performance. So typically what I do is I fly really fast in a straight line, do a 180 degree turn, uh, floor it in the opposite direction to make sure there's no you know crazy prop wash there. And then the last thing is the anti-gravity where uh, I'm gonna take the throttle and I'm just gonna chop it up and down and I'm gonna see how the nose reacts. And I'm gonna be listening for any like grinding or ticking sounds, things like that, but right now everything sounds completely smooth. Another thing I'll do is I'll lift up, lift up the nose, lift up the sides, and I'll also listen for that ticking and grinding sound. Um, everything sounds clean right now, but if you do get that, that could be a sign that your D gain is too high or your filters could be a little out of whack. But uh, everything's sounding good here, so I'm gonna go ahead and take off. And first things first, smooth forward flight. So let me get turned around. I'm gonna take my hand off the pitch and roll stick and just see what we've got. So far, everything looks great. Yeah, nice and smooth. Next, uh, prop wash performance. Oh, basically a little bit right there, but basically no prop wash at all. And that's full throttle the opposite direction too, so. Yeah, it's great. Last thing, we're gonna check for the throbbles. Oh yeah. Nose is all over the place. So we're definitely gonna need to raise up the anti-gravity. Oh yeah, okay. Let's bring it back in and crank up the anti-gravity gain. At stock, it's at 3.5, um, which I think works really well for race quads, but these heavier freestyle quads, you typically need a little bit more, more gain. You can jump this number up quite a bit too. 
I think the most anti-gravity gain I've ever had on a five inch build was up to maybe 10 bigger seven or 10 inch crafts. I've seen it up like 12, 15 even. You can kind of play around a lot. Like you can move it up to 10, move it down, you know, big, big jumps on uh, the movements. I'm just gonna go ahead and set it to six because uh, from previous tests, bumping it up to six was probably the best. So right away I can tell the difference. There's still some throbble in there, but it's nowhere near as bad as it was when it was on 3.5. So I think what I'm actually gonna do is just raise it up a little bit more to seven. I think that will do it for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring it back in. Let's crank this up to seven, hit save. Oh yeah, huge improvement. I mean, there is still a little bit there, but I don't think that's a problem at all. So then finally, I just stress test everything. I'm not a very good spank pilot, but yeah. Let's do some very aggressive maneuvers. And what I'm looking for is to make sure nothing crazy happens. Because when you go out flying, you wanna make sure that your quad can handle pretty much anything you put it through. So yeah, just a lot of quick moves back and forth. Another thing to check too is uh, your motor temperature. I forgot to mention that earlier, but uh, if you see any motor heat, things like that, you may need to go back to the drawing board as far as changing some of your settings, but we've had zero motor heat with this build so far. Can't get too crazy because this is a customer's quad, but I am stress testing it pretty well, and I think this is a pretty very well tuned quad. To wrap up, I think using this tuning method here it's probably one of the easiest ways to get into the tuning process if, um, if you're curious. There are things that you can um, dig a whole lot deeper into if you want to get more into the filter side of things. Adding in some of the sliders that we didn't use, for example, the uh, dynamic dampening slider. Chris Rosser, PID Toolbox, uh, UAV Tech uh, on YouTube have some really awesome videos if you want to really dig into it. But uh, yeah, using these steps here keeps everything pretty simple and you can go from a stock to a really good flying quad uh, in about an hour. This drone we tuned today, we actually have available as a DIY kit on the Rotoriot store, um, but if you don't wanna mess with building it or tuning it, uh, I'll actually do that for you because we sell this as a built option uh, where it comes to you out of the box, ready to fly. This is actually going to a customer. I don't have his name, but uh, this afternoon, as soon as we finish here, I'm gonna take this tune and all of the settings that we've saved, and I'm actually gonna use that for Skyliners moving forward on 4.3 tunes. These are the steps that I take, and it will get your quad to fly good. It may not fly perfect, but it's gonna fly way better than stock settings. And you're not gonna have hot motors. Yeah, you may get a little bit of prop wash here. It's not gonna fly exactly like Alex Vanover's rig, but if you crash this quad, and let's say you chop off the tip of one of your props, it's gonna fly back to you. This quad, it can take a beating and still rip with smooth flight. Well, thanks for watching, guys. I'm Bruce FPV, and uh, hope to see you in the next one.